that that Buick Park Avenue Ultra, we were going to take that uh, that the pulley turns clockwise, so there's no reason for that thing to have a left-hand thread bolt in it. But it had that from the factory, and uh, my guy that was trying to take it out of there just he was screwed into aluminum, and he's wiped threads out trying to screw it out of there. Well, we drilled it out, put a helicoil in it, and uh, where's that bolt at? Yeah, I'll take it over here. Throw it at you. Throw it that bolt that went up in that power steering pump is. So that bolt right thread. there is a left-hand threaded bolt that holds that pulley in a 99 Buick Park Avenue Ultra, and it sort of blindsided us because you could look all they wanted to within the book and the and shop manual and everything else. You wouldn't have nothing to tell you. They're giving it to him. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about. Uh, we're gonna see if you guys know how to. Uh, to uh, identify some engine parts to start with. All right, so what's this? What is that? Uh, I'm talking chain about. Gear? Huh? I'm in chain gear? No. Just yeah, here, right here. 36 minus 1. That's not one of the test questions on your paper. If you can make this, you can make your notes on that. This right here is the gear that the crank sensor reads off of. The crank sensor is going from that side. You might have noticed a missing tooth there. Now you can tell that is the one that the crank sensor uses. Okay. Now, what's this? You'd be able to identify those on a cutaway. You notice there's a pulley, smooth, right above the crankshaft, right below the alternator. And you also might notice that you see an impeller here. Y'all are really not having a very good day today, right? That's the water pump, guy. Yeah? When you see this part right here, that should identify that as a water pump. Now I want you to know these things good enough where you can look at a cutaway engine and know exactly what you're looking at. Okay. What did you say the first one was? The first one was the crank gear. The crank gear. I mean actually the, the pickup gear for the crank sensor. Now what's that right there? That the radiator right here? cap? Huh? Radiator cap? No, it's way up here at the very top. Now you got, what, what connects right here? Anybody know? Anybody, can anybody say fuel lines connect right there? Yeah, fuel lines. What is this? <laughs> what is that? Fuel pressure. Fuel pressure. pressure regulator. Now don't come out of here thinking that a fuel pressure regulator is an EGR valve or you'll be like some other people I've seen that, you know, weren't told anything. All right. What's this right here? That item right there. The timing chain gear is here, the crank gear is here, and this is, you see that little funky shape? That's the oil pump on this engine. Notice on the nose of the crankshaft like I thought about? All right. See all this stuff looks a lot different on that electric. Oh yeah. yeah. Yep, this one right here was drawn by a guy that loves to draw this kind of stuff. All right, and I like using this right here. All right, what is this hole? What goes in there? So far, you're batting a thousand. What? The spark plug. Spark plug goes in that hole. Right answer. That's where the spark plug goes. I noticed the other two spark plugs right next to it. So no, that was the that was the point. That's what I was trying to. There's a spark plug and a coil right there, you know. All right. What's this for? That little bump. The actual the cam sensor for that camshaft reads off of that little bump. So every time it goes by, you're going to see that. All right. So the camshaft sensor? Yeah, the camshaft sensor, that's the actual trigger. Uh, this is a ferrous metal gear, and every time that goes wheeling past that little magnet with a, a coil wrapped around it, it, it causes one of these, you know. All right. What's that? Oops. 
Those right there are intake manifold runner control plates. And when you get to a certain RPM, it changes the length of the intake manifold runners from short to long, long to short, based on what you're doing. All right. What's that? That's a, a hydraulic valve lifter. Notice that's on one end of that rocker arm. Where's cylinder number one on this one? Can you tell me where cylinder number one is? If you know engines, you can look at this and tell me where cylinder number one is, even though it's not marked. See, I'm not telling you if this is a Ford or a Chevrolet or anything else. But you can still look at this thing and tell where cylinder number one is if you know what you're doing. Cylinder number one is always the rod that's the farthest forward on the crankshaft. Look right here. See that rod? Cylinder number one is right there. That's connected to cylinder, the number one piston. That's on that side. All right. Now, compression tests are as old as engines. Noah got out of this this morning, didn't you, Noah? All right, and everybody who has done much engine work has performed one and used the data to cement the diagnosis. Uh, if, if I'm checking for compression, what should I, I mean, what's the go, no go thing on compression? Like if you're looking at compression, uh, what did you find on yours? Less than 25. Less than 25 PSI. That would be a deal breaker, wouldn't it, on that cylinder? Now, you use the cylinder leakage tester to figure out where the compression was going, right? Where'd you get, where'd, where was it going? Into the other cylinder and into the radiator. Into the radiator, into the other cylinder. That means we're basically pushing uh, compression into the water, which makes it overheat really fast. And we've also blown the uh, gasket between two cylinders. Right? Okay, so you got issues with that. All right, now, a dynamic compression test is a really significant diagnostic tool, but most people don't often use it. Uh, you can pinpoint the cause of a misfire when all the usual tests don't reveal the problem. Now, static compression and cylinder leak now are just checked for how well these cylinders seal against compression loss. That's what you were checking. Now, what you did with your cylinder leakage test, you want to know where the compression was going. You can have a low compression on a cylinder without knowing where it's going, and you know, you, you get to gather more data so you'll know what's going to need to be done. You make a vacuum gauge, you measure manifold vacuum, and see if it can breathe good. Whenever it's, see that right there? You wrote that out that, that this green is actually between 15 and 22, but I like to see it between 18 and 22 inches of vacuum island with that thing connected. Now, if I see that needle bouncing, I know I got valve issues, right? I mean, I know we still are some, but I know there's a valve problem if it's bouncing. You could probably, Noah, you could probably crank your vehicle up, hook a vacuum gauge up to the manifold, and you see that needle bouncing. That's telling you right away, you know, with very little, you know, uh, and this right here is a graph of what it looks like, uh, the compression inside the cylinder looks like it was drawn on a graph. Uh, running compression test provides the quality of a particular cylinder's volumetric efficiency. So you got a misfire detected and all that. Each cylinder is supposed to pull air in, retain it for the correct amount of time, and release it into the exhaust. If it can't perform the function, the result can be a loss of volumetric efficiency or a density misfire. Now, volumetric efficiency means that if I've got a three liter engine, how much air is it actually able to ingest and pull through? So if you turn the crankshaft two times, you're moving three liters of air. That's what a three liter engine is all about, right? But if it's running really fast, the air has got to go in here and make a bunch of curves. Before it gets in there, it winds up losing some of that. It's not actually pulling three full liters of air. Now I can pull a 1.8 or something like that. But if you put a supercharger or a turbocharger on it, that's not naturally aspirated anymore. It's pushing the air in there. It's grabbing air and shoving it down the engine's throat. So you might get four liters of air in a three liter engine that way. Okay. Uh, so this chart's for a four cylinder. Make sure your chart's got enough lines for the cylinders you got. A six cylinder would need six and eight cylinder as far as how many? Eight. eight. Okay. There was a guy that walked up to me uh, a couple of days ago and he had a, this Taurus. Not here. It wasn't here. It's somewhere else. He walked it up and he looked at the three spark plugs that he could see. And he says, uh, let's see, this six cylinder just has three spark plugs, is that right? I said, pardon me? He said, yeah, these three plugs, that's all the plugs it's got. And I says, usually it's got one spark plug per cylinder. And if it's a six cylinder, which he'd already said six cylinders, 
there's going to be three more. And there's another head in the back with three more buttons. And we got to look back and go, oh yeah, there are three more back here. All right. Okay, fill in the chart with data. You begin with a static compression test. You screw the, uh, it's what you're supposed to do if you do a static compression test the right way is you pull all the plugs out, you start with number one cylinder, you have your piece of paper ready, and you spin this thing over six puffs. Got a good strong battery. You need to disable your fuel system, because if you don't disable your fuel system, you're going to be squirting gasoline in there. It's going to change the reading. So just stop the fuel system from squirting any fuel. If you can, use your starter button and just spin it over without even having the key on. You know what I mean? And you go, one, 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 you go about six puffs. One, two, three, four, five, six. And watch that needle. If the needle is trying to leak back down every time without giving you a good reading, that little Schrader valve in the bottom of the gauge needs to be replaced. And this is kind of a special one. But anyway, so you start out with a static test. Like this one, you got 160, 175, 150, 160. That's what we're going to write in that first one. We're just going to, you know, find the static column is where you're going to write it. Duh, you know that. Okay. Now, when I pull all the spark plugs back in, except the cylinder, you're checking. Shorten the spark to ground on that one and disable the cylinder. Don't just pull a spark plug wire off and let it jump spark wherever it can, because that damages things, okay? You always want to take a, either a spark tester or something, or an alligator clip wire or whatever, and make sure that spark is shorted dead to ground so that it's not popping under the hood and trying to set fire to stuff and all that other kind of stuff. All right, you started with your gauge in place to take idle readings while holding the engine at 1200, which is just about idle, but do it anyway. And put those numbers in the idle column. The other, not as much. You know why? What I just talk about. I talked about how if the engine's running faster, the, the uh, air's got to go through the air filter and the zip tube, and it's got to curve in to do this intake. You're going to not get, all the air's not going to get in there because your volumetric efficiency is not going to be perfect on that when you're running 1200 RPM, even not loaded. Put those in the idle column. Okay, so now we've got these numbers, and we've got these numbers, which are slightly lower than those numbers. Okay, now snap the throttle of 2500 to release. The reading should rise according to the results in a snap call. These numbers should be at least 80% of a static reading. Okay, now look at this. We got 85 right there. You see a problem? See, this was 125, that was 130, that was only 85, that was 120. So now we've got some data that we didn't have before that we can use to sort out maybe what's going on with this thing. If a snap reading is much below 80% cranking compression, it's not able to get the air it needs. Worn intake cam load, intake valve carbon deposits. Carbon deposits on the intake valve partially clogs it up where it can't get the air. Uh, weak valve springs, worn valve guide, rocker or push rod problem. Intake manifold, runner valve issues. That's the valve I was talking about earlier. There's Kathy. Hey, Kathy, how you doing? Uh, is that the dodge you were talking about? Uh, no. Our contract's a site. No, that's an older dodge. Um, they don't have a listing for it either. It's probably going to... Uh, well, I guess we need to find a real park site. I know, there. right? Yeah. There's your slow way. It's a white box part. probably came from China, but it'll be okay. Right, but um, I'll call Massey and see. Mm -hmm. All right. And I'll just get do a part number in Find out if there is one. Okay, go ahead. Find out if there is one. All right. Give her a mark down. She's one of my favorite parts people. Okay. Now, a snap measurement that's over 80% of cranking compression, like that one there would be, uh, means the air is being improperly trapped when it should be leaving. That's exhaust valve issues. Look for exhaust restrictions, which is a clogged catalytic converter or muffler, valve train issues, bent exhaust valve push rod, worn exhaust stem load, collapsed exhaust valve lifter. Uh, one of the stories I like to tell is how his buddy is working the next service bay over there working on a car. He tried and tried and tried to start it. He said it's got spark, it's got compression, it's in time, it's got fuel, it's got clean spark plugs, it's got everything it needs, and this thing still won't start, and it is beating me up. I don't know what to do with it. And uh, I said, pull three, three of the spark plugs out. And he did. And so I said, now try to start it. And it started up. And it was, you know, sounding like machine gun coming out of the spark plug. He said, what the heck does that mean? I said, that means this catalytic converter stopped up. I don't even remember where I learned that or how I found it out, but it's in my stored in my hard drive somewhere. You know? But anyway, there's all there's gonna be stuff if you do this a long time where that you'll remember stuff that will help you, but you don't remember which car you learned it on. <laughs> you know, I mean I was fixing like between three and five thousand cars a year when I was at a dealership and I, you know all that stuff just runs together. But if you learn how to sort the data out in your mind, you can do better. If you get low reading and idle, and also on a snap test, the cylinder is leaking compression somewhere. Bent front valve, valve seat, carbon buildup, valve guides, 
Now, carbon buildup can actually build up enough where it can hold the valve open where it leaking past it. Also, if you've got a valve that starts to leak a little bit and it keeps leaking past it, that old hot uh, exhaust going past there will eventually burn that valve. You've heard about burned valves before. So the leakage test might reveal the leak point. Worn valve guys. See how that valve down there looked different from that one and that valve went up and down there where that hole at. Now, I was working at a truck shop in the mid-80s for a while and I do this job. It's kind of funny. I uh, hadn't been there very long at the time. And um, the international truck shop, and the, you know, now they call that Navistar International. But uh, the, the uh, local chicken outfit in Chiconagra brought this truck in there, and he says, uh, uh, This thing, not what it was a different, it was all a warehouse. Anyway, they brought it in there, uh, my, that kind of run together only. But anyway, he says, uh, uh, This thing has got, uh, it, it's skipping on one cylinder, and we never found out what's going on with it. And so I noticed it was skipping on this cylinder, I think it was cylinder number two, as I remember. And so I checked the compression, it had no compression at all. None. I mean, zero. It didn't have like low compression, it had no compression. Well, that's interesting. And so what I did was I added oil and tested it again, and this time I got 180 psi. What the sound the hell is adding the oil, bringing it from zero to 180? What the heck is that all about? So I told him what I found. He said, oh yeah, I don't think got something wrong with the rings in there, and then he got told him to rebuild the motor. You know? And I, so I got the valve cover off and found a problem. Some yo-yo had over rev floated the valve and dropped the push rod. Push rod between the lifter and the uh, rocker arm had come out of there and fell down in the thing. All right? So it left its proper domain, and that was just flopping around like that. It wasn't even open in that valve. Okay, so what a lot of people don't know is a piston with a good ring seal can create enough negative pressure in the cylinder, remember I put oil in there and it increased the quality of that ring seal, to, that the atmosphere can push the intake valve open far enough to get some air into the cylinder, and that's what was happening here. When I put that oil in there, it was able to actually pull some air in, pull the valves open and get some air in there, and then it was squeezing the air, giving me that compression. So you notice right here you got negative 8 pounds and you got plus 15. That's enough on an older engine to open the valve frame. Anyway, now what's wrong with this picture? Push rod came through the rocker arm, didn't it? Uh, my buddy Donnie sent me that. He had several of them like that. And somebody was over revving the ever loving crud out of that thing. And whenever valve starts hitting pistons, it's all, you know, the weak link, wherever it's at, is what's going to happen. You would have been a push rod, but that one went through the, was been pretty thin. And, Older vehicle there. That looks like some uh, Chevy to me, just looking at the way the rocker arm made. I don't remember. It seemed like it was a V6, but I can't all know. All right, here's another cutaway. Kind of what kind of engine is this? Do an overhead cam, overhead valve, Ford 5 liter, or a diesel? Ford 5 liter. All right, let me ask you the first one. Is it a dual overhead cam? Find the camshaft. Where is the camshaft? Is the camshaft on top of the head or is it going through the middle of the block? Going through the middle of the block. So it's not an overhead cam, is it? Mm -hmm. Not an overhead cam. The overhead valve is what it is. It's not a Ford 5 liter. How do I know it's not a Ford 5 liter? Read the words. What does it say up there? Okay. Corvette. And we know it's not a diesel because they ain't never put no diesel in no Corvette. Right? <laughs> so basically, just being able to glance at that's another kind of way engine. You need to be able to glance at that and see what's in it. Where's number one cylinder on that one? Remember what I told you earlier? I'm going with A. I'm just kidding. Huh? You're going with A? Can't tell from this picture? Come on. What did I just teach you a minute ago? I'm just kidding. You're making it up to All right. I'm going to go with D. Where is cylinder number one? Yeah, what uh, is that? Cylinder number one, but there it is. Is it at bottom dead center? No, it's not. Driver's side front. If you knew that this was a Corvette engine, then you would know that this is cylinder one, three, five, seven, and the other side two, four, six, eight. Well, that Ford engine, it starts on the other side and goes one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight. And the firing order on yours is, you know, no, it's one three seven two six five four eight. 
Well, yeah, but it goes just like they just said it. Oh, come on. An engine's been removed from a high mounted rear wheel drive here and resealed for several serious haulings. This is your question, now you're ready. We're ready. After the engine is reinstalled and started, a transmission fluid leak appears from the bell housing area. Technician A says the front pump slash torque converter seal was probably damaged during the repair. Technician B says the PCB system needs to be checked. That's what kind of caused the engine only. Who's correct about that? Everybody, put your answer down. This is a difficult question. Alice. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for everybody to answer it. You got an answer to it? What did you put down, Michael? You got an answer? All right. You got an answer. You got an answer down there? Yeah. But you know you got one? You got one? You got one? Okay. <laughs> Can we make the greatest one as we go? Yeah. You did not put both. You got it wrong. You got it wrong. All right. Customer complains her gas pedal sticks at the top of the travel and pops loose as she continues to apply foot pressure to the pedal. This problem is probably due to A, a sticking throttle cable, B, a warped throttle plate, C, a dirty throttle body, or D, a damaged throttle position sensor. Still thinking? Yeah. You already answered it? Everybody already answered it. Is there anybody that hasn't answered it yet? Is there anybody that's waiting until I, when you give me the answer, you can change your answer? I had a guy over at G Tech that was answering his questions real faintly. So he, whenever I would grade the test, he could erase them, but the right one. <laughs> and so I went, over, I went over there and says, Let's see your paper. Oh, look what you did. Let's go ahead and mark them real good. Where are you going? Let me hot there, are you? You made a 50 on that test. Uh, it's a C. If you didn't put C, mark it, slap yourself and mark it wrong. You put a C. I saw that happen. She put D. I put D. I was going to put C. I thought I saw her circle a C. You did. That was the first one. I got it right. Well, now, Dag Nevis. Okay. Uh, 40, fuel 401 code will probably be due to what? A sticking out of air control valve, an always open canister purge valve, a smaller average leak, or a clogged DGR passage. Katie, you answered it? No, I'm having a brain fart. Huh? Um, if you don't have those codes memorized, you're going to have trouble with that one anyway. I don't know. I think that's right, though. She just circled one at random. Okay, this is Claude BGR passes. See? A misfiring spark plug will cause the oxygen sensor to indicate what kind of exhaust? Rich, clean, hot, cool. If it's a misfiring spark plug, what will the oxygen sensor show? Everybody got an answer? That's going to be a lean exhaust. You know why? Because that oxygen sensor couldn't care less about fuel. All it cares about is oxygen. If it ain't firing, there's oxygen going to be coming out of there too, right? Don't ever fall in that trap again. All right. An air leak between the mass airflow sensor and the throttle body will cause A, long fuel trim readings to correct to the positive, long fuel trim readings to correct to the negative, oxygen sensor failure, or canister purge failure. You must have your answer put down in five, four, three, two, one. Tell me what a mass airflow leak, leak between the mass airflow sensor and the throttle body is going to do. It's going to cause the mass airflow sensor to under-report the air. If it under-reports the air, what's it going to do with the fuel? It's going to under-deliver the fuel. If it under-delivers the fuel, under-delivers under -delivers the fuel, you're not going to have enough fuel. If your oxygen is really lean, the fuel film will correct to the rich. So if it sees lean, it's going to command to go rich, right? Are you burning this in? Are you getting where you're going to just know these automatically? I know you are. I see your wheels turning. All right. 
after undergoing major work in the body shop, a no start condition is being investigated. The PCM won't communicate with the scan tool, and there's no reference voltage present in any sensor. This happened here. Actually, the body, the auto body department worked on his dive truck. It was real similar to yours, a couple of years older. And it came in here, and there was no start after they did the body work on it. But it was crazy. Now, Nation Hayes says the body shop has damaged the PCM on a welded body panel. They need to reset the power and ground the PCM to be checked. Whose idea should be pursued first? I would go with technician B on that one. You need to check power and ground with PCM because if it ain't got power and ground, just like any other electrical device, you're not going to work, right? Power and ground's okay. Then you're going, you know what I did to find out what was wrong with this one? I went over to the uh, my junk that I had over next door and I came back over here with a engine controller that was just exactly externally, just like the one on that Dodge truck, except it came off of a Jeep Cherokee or Grand Cherokee, and I plugged that sucker in. And the scan tool, I mean, the truck didn't like that engine controller because it wasn't the right one. And uh, am I going to hurt the truck plugging the wrong engine controller into it? Heck no. I may hurt the engine controller, but I ain't going to hurt the truck, right? And it was an old engine controller anyway. Plugged it in, scan tool would talk just beautifully. That tells me everything like it ought to be as far as connections. Plugged the old scan tool back in, dead in the hammer. Well, I says, but the, the, the auto body instructor says, well, we disconnected the battery. Well, that don't matter. If you disconnect the battery and you hook the ground up over here and you're welding over here, it's going to go find, <laughs> find a way for all that high voltage to go through that engine controller because it don't take much to fry one. All right. I always unhook the engine controller if possible or hook your ground right by where you're welding. Don't hook the ground up here and weld back there. Hook it right to the same place you're welding as close as you can and you're less likely to have that problem. An engine is being investigated for an overheating problem. The engine has started after a six hour cold soak. That means it's been sitting there all night and allowed to run for 60 seconds. Now, you shut it off. A hissing sound is heard of escaping pressure when the radiator cap is removed. Shh. You only ran it for 60 seconds. And you hear a hissing sound coming out of the radiator cap. What does that mean? I don't see any pins scratching. We just talked about that the other day. I'm trying to think. That means you got compression getting into the water. Heavy. Mm -hmm. So you see. A loose fuel filler cap will generally set what code? I'm going to say C. It looks right. Nope. Fuel 455. <laughs> If that cap's loose or the gap is destroyed. You learn all that in, uh, in electrical, right? All no, you'll learn it in engine performance and emissions and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Variable yeah. cam timing was originally used only for what? We talked about that too, didn't we? I didn't. I don't know. I did on electric. Yeah. Knox control. What they would do instead of putting an EGR valve on there to circulate exhaust gas. On the Ford Contours back in 1995, 96, and the background, they would close the exhaust valve early and keep the trap some of the exhaust gas in there. <laughs> they just wouldn't, you know, all come out there. But it was the only reason it was used was for knocks control. It, it wasn't to help the engine have better power and all like that. It was to trap some of that. Question number ten: Retarded cam timing and retarded ignition timing can both cause what? Low engine vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you'll have low engine vacuum because of other reasons, but usually these are the reasons for it. All right, everybody make 100? Yeah. Well, if you didn't, you should have. That's all I got to All right. Did you learn something? I did. You know something now that you didn't know before, right? Are you going to strengthen the neural pathways and remember it? Yeah.